Does anybody else enjoy watching nature shows? Like watching animals doing the crazy things that animals do? I really particularly miss the crocodile hunter because the guy was kind of nuts for most of his life, it seemed. But he was one courageous fella. Now, one of the reasons he could be so courageous is because he had studied what we might call the enemy. He knew their tactics and he knew their way of doing things. And I always love those shows where you get the announcer on. And you know it's a voiceover after the fact, but he's talking as though he's really there on the scene. And, and look at the cheetah coming up close on the gazelle. Will he get it? Will the gazelle flee today and be free once again to reign? And yet you know it's happened way after the fact. And so today I want to talk about that topic. When we go through this Measuring Up series of what it means to be fighters or flyers. And if you want to turn the Bible, we're going to stay centered in one particular spot this morning. And if you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, that would be the place we're going to dig in. Now, 1 Samuel 17 is following up, ironically, after 1 Samuel 16, which is where we ended at the beginning of this series. In the beginning of the series, we talked about David and Saul, the first two kings of Israel, and the differences between these two men, and how Saul was described as a man who was a head taller than all the rest, and the people thought he was going to be a great leader. And for a little while, he was. And David is very different from him. And our key verse we're going to talk about this morning is there on the screen behind me. It says, On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Some of us go through those seasons where we're dismayed and terrified. And what I'm suggesting this morning is that in those moments, we need to look to God. We need to remember the promises that he has given. So let me set up the story just a little bit. Judges chapter 2 verse 10 tells us about what's been happening. And I'm almost to this point in my reading program right now. I'm reading in Deuteronomy right now. And you get through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and you get to the point where Moses is about ready to die. And then you kind of backtrack a little bit with Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy is that season of God's people getting ready to go into the promised land. The 40 years of disobeying are up, and it's time to get ready to go. And you get in the book of Joshua, and they go in and they conquer the promised land, and there's a problem that we see, and this describes the situation. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. And that's the problem. Moses had Joshua. Joshua was trained up under Moses to be able to lead God's people. But there was nobody after Joshua. And the situation is such that the people didn't grow up and learn God's ways. And it led to all kinds of chaos that we see throughout the book of Judges. In fact, the last verse in Judges says this, In those days Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. They didn't acknowledge God as their king, as they had been taught to do early on. But everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we get that a lot today. Well, I think I should be doing this, so I, I think I'm going to go this way. In our postmodern society, we see this echoed over and over again, that there's no absolute truth, that there's no one right way. But the Bible says there is. In fact, the Bible teaches that that's foolishness to think that the right way for that person is totally right for them and your way couldn't be anywhere near that. The Bible teaches absolute foolishness to think that way. And so here was the situation at the end of Judges as we got ready for what we started with in this series. So let me get to the setting. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, and if you're not there already, I encourage you to turn there. It describes that God's people are on one hill, They've been in the promised land. They have conquered most of it. And the Philistines are the people who live over on the coast. And the Philistines have come over to take battle stance against them. Some of you can remember back from history in high school. You remember how back during the American Revolution you used to have that crazy thing where you had those muskets that didn't hardly work for beans anyways. And everybody stood in a line. So some of you stood on this side right here all in the line. 
Some of you stood on this side all in a line. And then everybody at once decided it was time to shoot. Crazy way to do battle. Well, it kind of is like what was happening here. There's two opposing hills and there's a valley in between and God's people are gathered on one side and the Philistine enemies are over on this side. You don't need to know the names of the places because you won't remember them anyways. That's the story. The problem comes in in verse 4. Story of a guy you may have heard of before. It says, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. You don't have to convert units of measure. It says, He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. Mind you, they're out in the desert getting ready to fight between two hills, and it's hot. And this guy is wearing this stylish 125-pound bronze coat of mail. He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. This is one bad dude. He's huge. He's a giant. And he's carrying more stuff than probably some of the guys to battle him from Israel's army even weigh. And he comes out. The Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistine's words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. You're probably familiar with the story. Every day this guy comes out and says, got a challenge for you. Rather than all of us fighting each other, you send out one man and I'll come out. And if you guys win, we'll become your slaves. And if I win, you become our slaves. And day after day after day, 40 days of this have gone on. And every day when he comes out and takes stand in front of all of them, God's people cower in fear. Now, it's really a funny picture because Saul is a head taller than all of the rest of the Israelites. He has led them into many battles that God has provided victory through. And yet, for 40 days, they have been preparing to do battle. And every day, they come back cowering in fear again. And then enters the future king. Young David has been in the service of Saul, and his job so far has been to come and to play the harp. He's not there full time, we read from the scriptures. He goes back to tend the sheep for his father, Jesse. And one day his dad sends him along and says, Son, it's been 40 days now. Why don't you go see how your brothers are doing? Because his three oldest brothers have been engaged as dad thinks, in the battle. And so he sends supplies with David as well. If it's been going on 40 days, that's quite a battle. Son, take these supplies to your brothers. And David comes on the scene and he's talking about what's going on. And it says that as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his usual lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. And when the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. And he asks, what's going to happen to the person who takes him out? We are God's people. How can we do this? You guys have been standing around for 40 days letting this happen? How can you do this? What's going to happen to the man who takes him out? And they say, well, word on the street is that Saul's going to give him one of his daughters, and he's going to be rich and famous in all of Israel. And David said to Saul, the king, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Little David comes up and says, Saul, I'll do it. Now, some of you have times in life where you are prepared to do great things. And to say it kind of like we would talk back in my family of growing up, someone poo-poo's on your parade. Someone comes along and says, there's no way you could do that. 
I'm so glad you have these great ambitions, but there's just no way. There's no way that you could do this. And Saul the king begins to say that to David, who has said, listen, I'm ready to fight. And David backs up his argument. He says, king, you don't understand. I have served my father. And there have been times as I was out with the sheep that both the bear and the lion have come up. And I have killed them with my bare hands. And this guy is nothing compared to them. If God is on our side, I will go and... So Samuel, excuse me, Saul, has another idea. So we look at which one really has the faith. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy and he's been a fighting man from his youth. There's just no way you can do it. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. And then he threw in one other little thing. He said, here, David, I, I suppose it's okay for you to go. It's really my job as king to lead my people. So, here, why don't you put on my armor? If you're going to go out and fight, you, you might as well try to protect yourself in some way. I mean, you're just dressed in shepherd's clothes. Here, take out my things. Now, I remind you, He's, Saul is a head taller than all of the rest of the Israelites. And David puts it on and says, Oh, king, I can't go out in this. this never, there's no way I could do this. I'm not going to go out dressed like you. I'm going to go out and trust in God. You know those famous words. He took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. David went out to do battle <laughs> with a simple sling and five stones. And some have wondered, why did he take five stones when you know the story? <laughs> Goliath had four brothers. So the question this morning is how will you handle this? Fatherhood is frightening, but fleeing is not an option. Fatherhood is a frightening thing. The, the greatest joy in many men's lives is that moment you first hold a baby. That joy that God has blessed you with a child, whether it be a son or a daughter. And it also leads to some of the greatest challenges in life. Now, all of us face giants in our life. All of us face giants. Some of them masquerade as other things, though. I'll just throw that little bit of warning out. In life, some of us face giants of loneliness. We live alone. And we face that giant of loneliness, and sometimes it's really leading to part of a greater problem. For some, in the, our way of dealing with that kind of giant, we lead to other things like gossip. Because we're living alone and when we hear the story of what's going on in someone else's life, it's so, it's so entertaining to us, we just got to tell somebody else before we've even gotten to whether it was true or not. I give out that warning. For some of us, our giants in life that we're afraid of are in our finances because we're just afraid that I'll never make it. For some of us, we have giants of relationships in our lives. When it comes to fatherhood, fleeing is not an option. We talked about this last week, that there are 24 million kids in America who don't have a biological father present. Dad is simply not even in the picture. And that's tough. For many of those, you know, mom and dad stood at the altar one day and said, till death do us part. And somehow something else has creeped in. And dads have taken the focus off the vow that they made before God and others. And they've taken the focus off of what God has taught in his word of training to become a dad. But the reality is that the stakes are too high and when it comes to fatherhood, fleeing is just really not an option. 
Second thing is that not only is fatherhood frightening, but doing nothing is not an option. You know, back in the story, for 40 days, Saul, as their leader, has done absolutely nothing. He stood by and watched 40 days as his fighting men prepared to get on the line, and then Goliath came out. And day after day after day, he did nothing. The thing I want to say is that for some of you as dads, it's the same thing. Doing nothing is not an option. Maybe it's not, it's not part of the 24 million kids who don't have a father present. It's for the millions of kids beyond that who have a father who is physically present, but not emotionally present. Not really there when a kid has a game and dad's off golfing or something else. Dad's agenda is all about his joy and his happiness instead of being a dad. Doing nothing is not an option. Just being present is not enough. Forty days. They came forward every morning and evening and took a stand. And God's people did nothing. Third thing I want to talk to you about this morning. Fatherhood is frightening and we must fight against the fear. We have to fight against the fear. There are times when it makes sense to flee something. There's times when we have to be men and stand up and do the right thing. And as dads particularly, we have to do that. Saul had given David great reasons on why he couldn't fight him. You're too small. You don't have the training. Goliath has been a fighting man ever since his youth. But David knew better. David knew. Sometimes his parents, we have to fight against the fear of our kids getting mad at us. I had a great discussion with this with my sister over these past couple days. We talked about the screens. Kids today are known as part of the screen age because they have one of these and they have one a little bit bigger all the time. In fact, it's part of the cultural thing. For those of you who aren't familiar with this, if your kids are going to Bluffton this year, they're going to have one all day long. And if they're old enough, they get to bring it home. Could be a great thing. Could be a great tool. The problem I talk about with my sister is how our kids are so disengaged so much of the time because they're stuck in front of a screen. And while I'm a big fan of technology, there's times where you have to, as a parent, stand up and say, it's time to turn it off. It's time to turn off the TV. It's a whole lot easier as a parent to let the TV do the job, to let the internet do the job. Put in front of a computer, by the time they're five, they can hop on the internet sometimes at four, and they know how to turn the computer on, they know how to turn on a web browser, and they know how to begin going and finding things that they're interested in on the internet at four and five years old. And it takes a parent to stand up and say, enough is enough. For some, we're so afraid that if we discipline our kids in some way, they're going to call somebody. And it has to be time that enough is enough as parents. That we say, I'm not going to continue letting my kids go that direction. And that's one of the biggest fears we have to fight against. And as much as I wanted to end this morning's message right here, I really wanted to just come back to this point and say, here was the difference between Saul and David. And the thing that led David to be able to go into this battle was from what God had spoken to Samuel that the Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And David, as a young man, stood up and said, if God is with me, I'm going, and I don't care how big that guy is on the other side, because my God is much bigger than that. And he courageously stood up and went, and you know how the story goes. As they approached Goliath, laughed at him and said, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Took his sling, phew! One shot, thumped him in the forehead, and Goliath falls down face first. David, without his sword in his hand, comes up, takes Goliath's, whoosh, cuts off his head, and makes a statement that day that we need to know. 
When God is for us, who can be against us? And I'd love to just wrap it up right there. And let's go home all charged up. There's a problem. Families have to be active in their responsibility to raise in a generation who knows the Lord, remembers what He has done, and recognizes what He is doing. If we're not engaged in that, men, particularly women as well, we failed. We have to be engaged in that. And it does not stop the day that your child turns 18. Some of you are knowing and smiling right now because you know the influence that God has given you as parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and maybe great-great-grandparents as I have one, to teach about them knowing the Lord, remembering what He has done, and recognizes what He is doing. And I'm going to give you the greatest way of doing that. Sometimes it's the most courageous act you will ever do. And a lot of times we think that as parents we shouldn't do this in front of our kids. The story begins that in the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and they destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. There are times in life where we are supposed to be fighting for our families, and there's times where we're supposed to flee. And in that day, many, many years after defeating Goliath, David came into a funk. And he didn't do what the kings always do. The kings always go out and lead their men in war. And this time, he decided, I'm going to let somebody else do it. And our example, it's, I'm going to let the internet teach my kids instead of me doing it. I'm a little tired. Well, for some of you, you know what? They're out and they've got their own homes. They've got themselves into their own problems. They've said they don't want me involved, so I'm not going to say anything anymore. I'm just going to let them lead their lives. And we've let somebody else take our role of influence as parents and as grandparents. And on that day, you know the story of David walking around the top of his palace, and he spots a woman off in a distance bathing. And he sends his men off to go get her. And she comes back and he has sex with her and she becomes pregnant. And a whole string of sins that comes after that in addition to what he's just done. Men, the most courageous act you will ever do is repent and do it in front of your kids. The most courageous act you will ever do is to admit before your children, I messed up and I'm seeking God's forgiveness in addition to whoever else I wronged. And David on that day began a series of events that led to the murder of one of his good soldiers. But when he was confronted by the prophet Nathan, David made a change. And it goes back to that verse that God had said about knowing David. David was a man after God's heart. When David sinned, he came back to God first for forgiveness. And I want to encourage us this morning to think about this. Sometimes the most courageous choice is to freely, but repentance takes the most courage. There are situations in life that men, it's not being courageous to stand up and try to say, I'm just going to keep going back to the bar, I'm just going to drink less. It's not courageous to say, I'm going to keep hanging out with the guys when they bring that out during break time to look at those magazines. It's not courageous to keep engaging in those things that you know are going to be drawing you further and further away from God. It's the most courageous things at those times to flee. And for those times where you've stepped over the line and you've made the mistake, the most courageous act you can do is to repent and come before God and say, God, I'm sorry for the way that I've disappointed you. And today I want to turn away from that and I want to start life new. It's for men or for women. So this morning, we're going to end our message a little different than normal. It says in your bulletins we're going to sing Days Like Elijah. We're not. We're going to invite you to pray. I'm going to invite you to take a long season of prayer. I want to encourage you for those who need to, to come up here. And if you want me to pray with you, raise your hand and I'll come over and pray with you. But today's a day that the people of God need to be courageous. For some of us, the most courageous thing that we need to do 
is to admit before God, I've messed up. I have not been leading my family the way that I should be. I have not been leading a life that would follow after God the way that I want to. Jesus has given the example for us. He died on the cross and rose again so that we could live. He's paid the penalty for our sins, and what he asks in response is that we believe and turn to him and ask him to guide our lives. For those who have never done that, the neat thing is that God's word promises in that moment we don't live life alone anymore. God sends his Holy Spirit. It's not some act we have to do from some other ceremony to make it happen. God's word says at the moment that we turn to him and ask Jesus to be our Savior, we are given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes on different roles in our lives. For some of you, you know him as comforter. You're going through tough seasons of life. You're going through pains and you know that the Holy Spirit is a comforter who brings you back a sense of peace. For some of you, you're a guide. He's a guide in your life and you know that he's giving you direction. As you pray, you sense that he's speaking to you. He's a comforter. He's a guide. He speaks into our hearts. So I'm going to begin us with a word of prayer. If you've got an offering this morning, the ushers aren't going to be coming around. There are plates up here. I want to encourage you to take a moment of faith. And if you want to come on up, if you've got a connection card you want to turn in, you can turn them in either in the plates up front or in the basket on the table where the bulletins were at. I want to encourage us just to enter into a season of prayer as God's people this morning. And if you need to do that and come up here to do that, that's great, and I will gladly join you. If you want somebody else to join you, they probably will. But I want to encourage us today to take a courageous moment in our walk of faith. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, today I thank you because we find hope in you. We find encouragement in you, Lord Jesus, because we've seen your example. And prior to that, you've given us the examples of several countless men and women throughout the Old Testament. I thank you for David's life that you've preserved so much of it for us in your word that we can know. God, I think of that moment where just a boy stood up and said, I cannot be a part of letting this go on any longer. I cannot let the name of my God be spoken of like that anymore. And I will go, and I will fight that giant, and God will be victorious, because that's who he is. So God, this morning, I pray that we would take encouragement to step up to the plate as men, to lead our families. For those women who are here, who have that influence in their families that has been pushed on them, I pray that they would find their comfort and strength in you, Jesus. God, today, may we be a church that is not afraid to come before you and admit where we have wronged. Lord Jesus, we want to be a church that is known as courageous men and women who stand up for what they believe. Lord, thank you for those who did that in a way just a weekend ago at Relay for Life to stand up and support those who are going through a tough time in life. Lord, you want us to stand up in our families, not just be there, but to stand up and to teach what is from you. God, I thank you for those who are making those commitments today. I pray that as we listen to this song, that we would listen to the voice of truth, that we would listen to what you are telling us through your spirit to become courageous men and women who will stand up. God, for those who are given a tithe and an offering today, I pray your blessing on them. Thank you for their faith. Thank you for this act of faith. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would speak forth your truth in love to a community that needs to know you. That people would see something different in us. That we are courageous as we follow after you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.